Hello and welcome to the live streamer backstage podcast. I'm Alec Johnson and this is a weekly show where I interview fellow live streamers to understand how they're using live streaming as a tool in their business and to discover the tech, the gear and the software that they use to produce great live shows. My guest today is the man, the myth, the legend, Doc Rock. Doc has been my content creation coach and mentor since I began my YouTube journey, to use a cliche, uh, and I'm also happy to say he's a very good friend. He's the community manager for Ecamm, and any Ecamm Live user will tell you that the community is one of its best features, and Doc is a driving force behind that community spirit and strength, and so his role deserves high praise indeed. He's also the founder of the Let's Get Live community, another community that I'm proud to be a part of, which has helped provide a rapidly expanding platform for people to help one another learn and grow together. If I were to list all of Doc's prior experience and accolades, there'd be no time left for the interview. But what I will say is that he has a wealth of experience in the tech and content creation space as a trainer, speaker, writer, podcaster, designer, YouTuber. I could go on, but I'll let him tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but what never ceases to amaze me about Doc though is not so much his vast depth of knowledge, but his information recall abilities. I don't think I've ever heard him say, I think I'll have to go and look that up. It always seems that he has the answers right there and they are immediately immediate. It is a truly rare ability. Aside from all the technology, though, his motivational speaking and coaching abilities have been the most valuable to me personally, and I know for so many others as well in the various communities. One of the most important things to understand as a content creator is your purpose. What are you doing it for? How is it serving you? And how is it serving your audience? This is true for anything in life, really. But Doc is very clear on his purpose now, and he's been through a personal journey to get to that point. And he's very good at helping others to dig deep to find their purpose. And so that's what we'll be focused on in the show today. As always, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So without further ado, let's welcome Doc Rock. Hey, Doc, how are you doing Yo! today? What's happening? What's cheers, mate? <laughs> it's so so great to have you on the show, Doc. And uh, yeah, thanks for everything you've done for me personally over the past uh, few months and years. <laughs> it's been a real uh, real pleasure getting to know you more. And uh, thanks again for being here. Yeah, it's been just over a year, and it seems like it's longer though, right? Because like we talk all the time, <laughs> and I think that's the funny thing is I still hear people to this day say, you know, you can't make real friends on the internet. I was like, you can't make real friends because you just suck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, re the rest of us, we can't. You can do whatever you want. Like it's it's such a. I, I hate to start with the cliches already, but that is a, a, a really limiting belief. Right. Mm -hmm. And these limiting beliefs is what has most people stuck. Totally. I mean, the, the people that I spend, you know, my closest friends now are people that I've never actually met, it seems, <laughs> the people I spend most time with. So it's definitely, uh, definitely true there. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about, I mean, I think everyone who's watching this is, you know, already knows you, but there, there may well be some people, so some few people on some out <laughs> flung, or far flung places in the world who might never have heard from you about you. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about your sort of background and, and sort of how you came to get into content creation and live streaming. I know that's quite a long story, but. <laughs> no, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give the, uh, what they call it, the cliff notes version. Mm -hmm. Um, I have always been in and around entertainment because of either DJing or working crew, right? What I mean by crew, I was a sound man for a long time and my family owned an electronic store. So we sold, you know, TVs and stereos and stuff to the consumer side, but we also sold broadcast equipment. So for the TV stations and the movie producers and that, that would come into town and needed equipment, we sold and supported that. And so I had those skills from a long time that I often did that, you know, in a jobber style situation for concerts or events or, you know, productions that would come into town. Uh, like I, I, I worked sound on the movie uh, about John David Chapman, you know, the guy that killed Lennon. There was a docu piece that was done on him for like uh, IFC TV. And I was a sound man for that whole movie. Right. So I've been in, in it from just producing music in my closet with my friends to like actual film and TV production. I used to do uh, sound back to truck, which is like the gigantic board inside of a stadium that goes back to the truck that then turns to the satellite to send the picture to you somewhere for like the Hawaii version of the Grammys, which is called the Nahoku Hano Hano Awards. So yeah, I just have a lot of experience in this and, when content creation started to become more and more disambiguated and regular people can do it, 
I was like, I can teach from the technical side because I know so much about the technical side. You know, like I'm a mini Alex Lindsay, not exactly as high end as him, but I've been pretty close, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's like the dudes that have been to the moon versus the guys that's been to space. I'm on the moon. <laughs> Alex Lindsay would be space, but pretty close. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like I say, it's it's the depth of knowledge that you've got that is is pretty pretty amazing, really. But it is this thing of, as I mentioned in the intro, it's this information recall because I've learned loads of stuff, but I've also forgotten a load of stuff as well. <laughs> and it's you've, I've got this unique ability of always seeming to have like you know the information just always seems to be right there. That is uh, that I know that it amazes a lot of people. I know Rich is in the the chat as well, and we've talked about it before. It's quite phenomenal. You, you know, this is going to sound super crazy and. I think it's because I don't like to be challenged by other people's limiting belief. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was always told when I was a teenager that, well, you know, shouldn't do we, cause we's going to affect your memory and it's going to make you stupid or whatever. So I was going to be the we smoking kid in class with the highest grades and the impeachable memory because they told me that that's impossible. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> well, I, I, did it I knew from a very young age, like I think I started smoking. I was like 13. I was like, from that moment on, I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to ever forget anything because I just thought that was a really stupid thing to say about something. And I didn't, I never felt myself forgetting stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was like, why did they just, it was, just, it was fear. It was to scare you into stuff or to make you think that you're going to be dumb. And then, so one of the funniest things was, you know, in school, when they start handing out the rankings and it's like, I got the second highest GPA in the whole school and I'm missing it by like thousands of a point. And then I just remember like laughing at everybody and go, yeah, you know, the stoner kid, ha, you guys made fun of me. I'm smarter than all y'all. <laughs> so all of the parents that were telling their kids that kind of stuff, I'm like, I'm smarter than you and your kids. And so you should stop telling those lies. And yeah, so maybe that's where it comes from. I, I never thought about it until you said it. <laughs> well, well, I can tell you that it's not just me. Like I say, me and Rich have talked about this before, and, and I've talked about it with other people. And it's it's people people notice this thing that is like the information just seems right there. It's pretty pretty amazing. <laughs> In terms of the like the the, the live streaming side of stuff, um, obviously you've been uh, a community manager for Ecamm for. Uh, is it coming up for two years now? Um, but prior to that, obviously, really active in the community. I mean, the reason I found out about Ecamm was because of seeing you on uh, Mac Break Weekly, which I understand you've just done earlier today as well. Uh, and which is funny because I was on today, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's that's where I found out. That was my sort of gateway into into Ecamm. But where did you um, where where did you sort of make the sort of transition into doing live streaming as a more sort of uh, uh, sort of full-time endeavor. I know that you've had a YouTube channel for years. Where was the sort of pivot point where that became more of a focus for you? So it's funny because like I literally, we kind of talked about it a little bit today on Mac Break Weekly. I've been live streaming since it became a thing, like even when it was still in beta and I was almost getting ready to go work for Macromedia. Like before Final Cut became Apple, there it was a, it was a Macromedia program, right? And I was on the Radius Rocket team at that time. That was more like nonlinear editing, but they were already talking about like getting to be able to put video live. And then when Real Player came out, you know, I was in the programming stuff for Real Player at the time, things like that. I was always on betas for these various different programs. Uh, 3D, I don't know if you remember 3DI. It was kind of like a Xbox uh, CD style thing that had like interactive programming on it. I was working in 3DI, so been around it for a long time. And when the pandemic hit and I realized a whole bunch of my friends were going to be stuck with the inability to work, I was like, I have the experience and the knowledge to help them. Because although I, at that time, I wasn't currently live streaming, I knew exactly what to do because again, from the experience and, you know, from Justin TV and, and Vidler and all the kind of weird stuff that was out back in the day, Bla uh, Babel, mm -hmm. right? So I was like, okay, let me go in and, Oh, blabber. Sorry, babble is language. <clears throat> Let me go in and help these people. And I started with my DJ friends because so we did a, a show, of DJs live streaming, trying to teach all my DJ friends, like, what are you going to do now that all nightclubs and weddings and concerts have just been shut down? Well, there were companies doing work from home parties and they were doing things like on Fridays, let's do something fun like we would have done in the company. Oh, let's get somebody to come and DJ. And these guys didn't know, but you just hired a DJ and they would come and DJ over Zoom. 
Mm -hmm. right? So I was showing people how to do that. And that got me to Ecamm. And once you're in Ecamm, you know how the community works, right? People start asking questions about mics. I sold mics for 26 years. I know what to do. <laughs> what about cameras? I sold Sony cameras for 26 years. I know what to do. So it just became a, a process of being able to share just the information that was stuck in my head and me not being bored in the house. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's a, a common thing for a lot of people that, you know, over the pandemic, a lot of people look into these sort of things to take their whole businesses online and, uh, you know, translate over what they were doing previously in the in the real world as it were onto uh, onto online and uh, i guess that's that's part of the sort of driver of the growth of ecam recently as well that so many people were doing that just talking about the ecam community specifically though um i mean it is something quite exceptional and so uh, you know i know you haven't got necessarily got your ecam hat on today but as the community manager i'm wearing a shirt though you are wearing a shirt yeah, yeah but, <laughs> i mean it is quite phenomenal i i don't know of any other sort of community based around a piece of software quite like it i've certainly never found anything and you know i've been in a number of different communities for different different pieces of software that i'm really passionate about but what do you think it is about um obviously the community manager but about ecamm as well that um is um it sort of drives that that really close bond that everyone seems to have everyone is so willing to help each other everyone's so willing to uh, also you know encouraging to one another and, and celebrates each other's wins what what do you think the the secret sauce is there, or am I getting you to? I, I, think, it's, I think it's two things. <laughs> uh, actually, maybe three things. Uh, I'll start with the first one. Once you know, and you kind of do adjacent, Ken and Glenn, it is a full representation of them, right? They are the most caring, giving, and they want everybody to have the best, you know, a possible for them. And they have the skills to make that happen. So they're just going to pour that out there. That was evident to me as a user literally like two days after I got the program and everyone was talking about like, Oh, my picture. And how come my picture is so nice? I'm like, well, I connected with a cam link and they're like, well, what's a cam link? So I put out, you know, my Amazon link sold like 40 cam links that day. And then within the next week, cam links are gone. Nowhere to be found. <laughs> right. And at the time that I came into the group, we were at about 1500 people tops. Right. Um, in that next week, we're gone from 1,500 people to like 3,000 people. And then a couple of weeks after that, we're at, you know, 4,000 people. And about a month after that, we're at 5,000 people. So all these people are in and nobody can get cam links. And then so we were looking at the $20 Amazon clones and even they were becoming hard to get. And so it must have been, I want to say, four or five days into using Ecamm. Ken and Glenn are like, oh, everyone's having a hard time finding cam links. Oh, hold my beer. <laughs> they rewrote ECAM and made it so that it just works with the USB that's mm -hmm. built into many of the cameras. And I was like, I've never seen a company put forth that level of pivot in order to serve their community mm -hmm. that quickly. So I already knew it was going to be dope then. And I think that the second thing, well, the, that's the second. The third thing was so many of us jumped in all at the same time. So outside of our personal skills with the photographers or the sound people or the DJs or the graphic designers, the Marshalls, the myself, you know, the Limwell, right? He was the photographer, Marshall's designer. I'm sort of like the DJ guy. And Bradley was another designer. Like we found this sort of uh, tool chest of all these people that had these independent skills but the other people lacked another part. So we Voltron really, really quickly. And I think because we all came in so many of us at the same time, mm -hmm. it uh, that just became the culture of the community where no one person knew everything. You know, everybody you. was sort of doing their best Voltron part. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even, you know, like when, when you come in, you bring a, a, a teaching style to the table, a level of organization to the table, right? Michelle pops in. She brings a level of organization to the table. Uh, Keely pops in. She brings a level of sass 
(laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it just, she has a very good way of looking at things differently Mm -hmm. from the various heights, right? You know, I don't have to explain David Allen to you, Mm -hmm. but you know the, you know, the 50,000 feet, the 30,000 feet, 20,000, 10,000. Keely seems to be able to see all of those various levels and are able to come up with scenarios around that. Dina, much similar to Keely, but she also brings the, I've been working with high level software for years. So I know the software side of it as well as the user side of it. And here's how we bridge those gaps. So I think that was really cool about the Ecamm community is we were able to blend all of our stuff together to just come up with that sauce. God, yeah, that makes it makes so much sense now that you've sort of laid it all out like that. I mean, I was just one of right. the lucky ones who came in like after it was <laughs> all had this that sort of that sort of family vibe to it. I mean, it's the ecam. You know what it's like? It's it's, it's like pot thai. You could put whatever in it. Yep. If all the ingredients are good. It's better. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there's any community can make pot thai. Just throw everybody's stuff together. Mm-hmm. And if everybody's just kind of basic ingredients, you get it's a decent. You know, like you know, decent restaurant in California pad thai. They think they're doing it right, but it's wrong. Uh And then you get all top quality ingredients and you get that, you know, Michelin star level street food vendor to give you that pad thai. Yeah. So like I, we're kind of the, the, the latter more than the former. Yeah, but it, it is that thing that you mentioned as well, though, But because everyone is actually willing to help because you do get some communities that are full of really skillful people that have got a scarcity mentality and they don't want to share information and stuff. So it is, that, it is that sharing aspect that comes with all of that amazing sort of talent. I mean, one of the things that I've found that, you know, doing this uh, this podcast and interviewing so many of the sort of really amazing community members who are all of these people have been um, is that... Um, yeah, they've, they've all got such an amazing sort of, just like you, uh, history of skills and, and knowledge that they're all bringing to the table. So, yeah, it makes, makes total sense. <laughs> you, know, you know, here's another thing that was funny that I just thought about. You recently talked to Alicio. Mm-hmm. Alicio was coming from, he has the music part wired, right? Alicio is an amazing musician, right? Um, but he had the level of, okay, I want to learn all of this stuff, yep. and I don't know any of this. But he had the vulnerability to be like, okay, everyone wants to ask this question, but they won't ask because they're afraid to look foolish. Yep. He was willing to be the jester in that particular case. He was willing to be foolish for everyone else so that they could learn how to do it. So even he kind of knew what he was doing from the entertainer side of it, the technical side of it, Alicio put his pride away to let himself be the person to ask the mm-hmm. questions everybody else was afraid of. And that made everyone feel like they could ask whatever. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and he was very, very good at that. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize that, but at the time that it was happening, it was perfect because we were streaming like every day, just like working out better things, better things, better things. So it was a, it was a community effort, honestly. It just was. I just want to take a moment to talk about Ecamm Live. This is the live production Mac software that we're using to live stream and record this podcast. In my opinion, it is the best live streaming and recording software on the market today. So what exactly does it do? Well, essentially, it allows you to control the content that you're including in your video, be it a live stream or a recorded video. And you do this by building out different scenes that contain the content that you want to show. This content may be a feed from your camera or indeed multiple cameras, or you may be sharing a screen, which is what I do a lot of in my tutorial style videos that I make for my Take One Tech YouTube channel. You can share the screen from a second computer or maybe even a gaming console if you are a live streaming gamer. And just as we are doing in this podcast, you can also bring in guests using Ecamm Live's built-in interview mode, where guests can join from a browser and you can then incorporate their video and audio into your production. Finally, you can add all kinds of additional graphical and animated overlay elements and even movies to really add a level of branded professionalism that would be hard to achieve in any other way. The real magic happens though when you hit that record or go live button because then you are able to seamlessly switch back and forth between all of the scenes that you've created and indeed this is how all of the videos have been created for my Take One Tech YouTube channel and the reason it's called Take One Tech by the way is because all of the videos are made in one take with no edits. I just hit record, make the video and as soon as I hit the end recording button the file is there and ready to be uploaded straight 
straight to YouTube. What I love about Ecamm is not just the ease of use that it has when compared to other live streaming software, but also the greater flexibility it gives in terms of layouts and designs that you can create for your shows when compared to some of the hardware streaming solutions. And one thing that makes Ecamm great specifically for podcasts is the fact that it has the ability to record isolated audio tracks. So once we finish recording this podcast, I'll have a separate audio file for me, my guests, and any other audio tracks that have been a part of the recording. That makes the editing and repurposing of the content for the podcast so much more streamlined. It does have another little trick up its sleeve though, and that is its virtual camera feature. This allows you to take the video output from Ecamm live straight into communication apps like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Discord, and so on. This means that rather than just appearing in Zoom meetings with a regular camera feed, you can now show up with all of the amazing production values that Ecamm Live gives you and deliver that straight into your Zoom meeting. And trust me, when you rock up to a Zoom meeting with Ecamm, <laughs> the other participants will be truly amazed. So whether for live streaming, recorded video content, or to level up your Zoom game, I highly recommend you give Ecamm Live a go. You can get a free trial by going to takeonetech.io slash Ecamm. That's E c a m take one tech.io slash ecam and of course you can find a link to that in the show notes as well you will certainly not regret giving it a go now let's get back to the show perhaps we can talk then about um you know you, you've got it on a t-shirt maybe not today but uh, intent and purpose and what's been your sort of path to um you know the evolution of you've talked before about you know your youtube channel and how that's developed and uh, you know finding your direction in terms of content creation and what what's been your journey with that and how have you how how did you discover that i i came to a realization i don't even remember when but i came to a realization that hard work was not enough and, okay, during the late 80s to about early 2000s, I was in a hip-hop group, right? And we opened for all the major acts of that time period. So I've opened for Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. I've opened for Lisa Lisa and the Cold Jam. Uh, Sweet Sensation, Cover Girls, Public Enemy, uh, Tone Loke, Run DMC, Ice Cube, Ice T, all of the ices. <laughs> uh, I mean, like all the way down to like freaking new kids on the block. Right. So we opened up for all of these different people, Casey and Jojo. Like there, I have so many in my head. I can't even think of them all. And everyone told us how talented we are. We should hurry up and get our demo together. Right. We were having fun. We were working hard. We were practicing. We were writing our songs and we were having fun. There was never this intent to become like a professional group or have an album or whatever. So even when we recorded an album, the amount of work we put into it was important. But I don't think we had the full intention because we were also jockeying and partying like rock stars, going out with our girlfriends, going to school, working, hanging out with the family, that kind of stuff. It wasn't this thing like, you know, I locked myself in the basement for three weeks and created an album like we just, you know, we just we just didn't do that. Right. We were, we were too busy having fun and having a good time. So after we officially got our demo out and one of our people that was, quote unquote, helping us took our, our one inch and went to Florida to go shop it. And the tapes got washed away in Hurricane Andrew or Hugo or one of those a-holes. Um, and it was deflating. But I think because we never had that intention to make it quote unquote big time, there was no thing about, okay, let's get back into the studio and redo it. You know, we, we had all of the songs. We had been singing them thousands of times. Like we knew exactly what to do. We could have went right back in the studio and having known what we did, we could have recreated the entire album in like two days. And we didn't. And then so after I stopped doing that and I was just doing my club DJ thing, people were like, man, what happened to you guys? You guys were so good. You guys were everywhere. Every concert, every, you know, farm carnival, like whatever. You guys were all over the map. And even things like going to go to California with uh, Babyface and his wife, Tracy, to do a movie, you know, premiere and getting one of our groups that we were working with have their song inside of a movie. And like, like, why, why would you guys just not go back into it? Well, because at that time, 
it was just something fun that we were doing. So having seen stuff like that pass me by, at one moment I got up and I realized that hard work wasn't enough. You have to have an intention. Because when you run into a brick wall with intention, you like look at it, you go, I'm going to go get me a ladder, right? But when you're doing stuff sort of half ass, when you run into a brick wall, you go, ah, wall, I'll do something else, right? And then you move away. And so I think purpose is the same thing. It wasn't my purpose to share my musical talents with the world. My purpose was party like a rock star, drink, play golf, make a lot of money doing concerts and spend it, <laughs> you know, doing all this other stuff. So have not having that purpose also blown away. So I crammed to understand like how, what influence would I've had on the world had I gone through my musical journey when I actually had the contemporaries in hip hop that would love when they would come here and visit with us and tell my friend CJ, myself and my friend Ace, uh, that we had every opportunity to be out there. Then as a professional DJ, and I hear some of the crap that came out after we stopped gigging and we were better than that. Oh yeah. That, that part hurt a little bit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I don't know exactly what it was. Maybe it was when, when Ace passed away, realizing that we, we blew a shot from, not being hyper-focused, I think I looked at things a little bit differently as far as what the time frame is because, hey, I lost one of my bandmates in his 40s and that was just silly, you know? So maybe that's what it was. I never I never really thought about it. Stop asking me questions that bring up old stuff. <laughs> Stop talking about old stuff. <laughs> 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 and, and so in terms of the the actual, you know, your your purpose with content creation and what you're doing with, you know, Let's Get Live and all of that kind of thing. Where did where did that come from? You know, where did you actually sort of distill that down? Because I know you have got a very sort of clear purpose there. So perhaps you could tell us like what that is and and it's where you probably kind of like realize the same. I, I, man, this is crazy because I, I never thought about this because I just say it right. I don't really talk about the origin story, but it's probably the same. Realizing I had that talent and even the hookups to let that talent happen, and you know, uh, I was at the the music awards. With the entire, you know, uh, Def Jam posse two days before Biggie got shot. Like, I was in that circle. I came home that day because my boss and my partner on radio did not want to do the show by themselves. They made me come home. Like, I would, I literally would have been in that exact same motorcade when Biggie got shot. So maybe it's the concept of knowing that I was at this level, three feet from gold, you know, that mm -hmm. parable. And I didn't dig it through from not being on purpose. And I'm like, there's so many people with talent, skills, story to tell, whatever, that would be gifts that could be shared with the world and get other people to then lift themselves up because of somebody shared a gift that they have. And now I've come to the conclusion that it is selfish and stingy to let your fears and your hangups or whatever stop you from putting out greatness into the world. Mm -hmm. So I never, again, I thank you for the therapy session that I'm not paying <laughs> for. Um, I really don't think I ever put why, but it might've been when Ace passed away and, you know, my buddy CJ and I talk and like, like how, how could I be so selfish to let the talent that we have never hit the face of the earth because we were too busy clowning and not being on purpose. So to have a story to tell and not share it, because it's some whack fear that somebody else put on you to have a skill that you could teach people how to save money by switching to Geico. But then you don't put that out because you're afraid to be on camera. Those are just selfish. Those are rude and selfish and holding all the knowledge to yourself. Just ain't no good. It's better. Knowledge not shared is useless. Mm -hmm. oh, I to yeah. totally agree that. with that. <laughs> but almost it's the opposite end of the spectrum with you as well because uh, as well as you know not having that selfishness because you are so sharing uh, there's also something about you which is another amazing quality which is like how deeply you actually care about every single person that you know whether it's somebody on you know the 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 uh, the Friday demo for ecam or in you know our coaching sessions is this care really deep care that you clearly have for all of the people that you are 
it's problematic. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, it, it is almost to a fault because I know that you know it's yeah. like it, it can be a. You know, when you when you care deeply about people, and and you know, maybe you see some of them aren't doing as well as they could do, or you know, it, it's just so so evident to everyone how much you care about them, and it's it's just such a a nice thing to witness to see like how much effort and care you put into to all of the people that you are helping. Yeah, I I, I think part we talked about this a little bit on, on my stream last Saturday. Part of that has to do with. You know, some of the writings of Marcus Aurelius and Meditations or Seneca, like, again, to just have this and not share it. Okay, so to be born with that level of uh, apathy, empathy, sympathy, all of the these, mm -hmm. and keep them these to my damn self, that's just rude. <laughs> <laughs> just rude, right? So if you care like that, then do something about it. Like, put it out there and use it to bring people forward. Right. Um, you know, my my famous line is like, you know, the river, rivers don't drink their own water, you know, and trees don't eat their own fruit. What well, they kind of do. That's <laughs> we will we'll, um, we'll, we'll we'll gloss over that part. <laughs> we'll, we'll let that one slide. Right. Um, so every person is put on this planet in some way, shape or form to share something, do something, give something and to not do it because somebody took something from you is just wrong. I used to get mad at my friends who like, I'm going to give up dating. Why? Because, uh, you know, um, Michelle hurt my heart. That was just that one person. Like the rest of you is dope. So you're going to go hide in a room and, and just, you know, cry because Michelle broke your heart. That's just evil. Like, there's other people in the world that need to see you, including your 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 male friends, right? So why would you go and hide because some girl broke your heart? Like, this is selfish. So I think I've always been somewhat like that, but yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that, man, what the hell? Did you go to psychiatry school? And again, I'm not, I'm not paying for this crap. <laughs> So one of the other things then, let's let's uh, bring it round to this thing of like helping others to find their purpose, because that is the other thing that you're great at, is actually giving inspiring, insightful questions to actually sort of draw that out of people. Uh, and, you know, in our in our sessions that we have either one-to-one -one or with, uh, you know, the, the, the group sessions that we have as, uh, you know, the, in the drop squad um, and, uh, you know, other little groups, it's this thing of, you know, asking these insightful questions. So how... How, what, what sort of advice would you give to people who are in that position where they maybe aren't entirely clear on, you know, what their purpose is or, you know, maybe they decide that they, they're starting this for some reason, but they, they maybe quite, can't quite entirely justify or aren't quite sure on that. How, what, what is some advice that you could give to people like that in terms of how to find this kind of thing? Okay, so finding your purpose, yeah, that's a little bit difficult. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but I have a general formula. And I think there are some, I'm trying to think of what's the proper words. There's some mix up between this understanding of like passion and purpose and things like that. Purpose is above passion. I have a passion for Manchester United. I ain't going to run next to Cristiano Ronaldo <laughs> and then try to put a ball in the net. Like, my knees don't do that no more. Does that kill my passion for Manchester United? Not a drip. But I might have a purpose, say, of getting more, you know, Americans that football is round and not oblong, right? And so I would start a podcast. And I would create videos and not explain the offsides rules that no, even freaking British people don't know and they made the damn game up. <laughs> uh, uh, I would, you know, show how maybe you think it's boring because you've been watching college stuff on ESPN, but in the beautiful game, like the EPL, which is the pinnacle, uh, those games ain't boring. <laughs> those games, like, they rock and there's a lot to it. I would explain things like, you know, the average player runs between 15 and 20 kilometers per game. Like, that is insanity, bro. <laughs> you know, <laughs> could you imagine every time, three times a week playing a sport that has you running, you know, almost 20 kilometers every time, no matter what, win, lose, or draw? Like, so there's a lot more skill to what goes in the game. 
But because of other people letting other people say dumb stuff about soccer, majority of our country pays no attention to it. And here's the silly part. We all played it up until high school. We had to. It was part of gym. And we loved it. It was fun throwing elbows and, you know, doing whatever, getting little orange slices at halftime. But once you pass high school, it wasn't really a collegiate thing, depending on where you live. And you started hearing guys on ESPN poo-poo it. You hear guys at the other sports club poo-poo it. And it goes away, goes away. And then eventually the whole country thinks horribly about a sport that's older than our freaking country. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then you come and you think to yourself, the only realization is maybe the reason why it gets poo here, the guys on TV started it, is because they don't get commercials. Oh, now it makes sense. You know, it starts to make sense, right? Of course, when we got good at it and we started hitting the World Cup, oh, then things change a little bit, right? When the girls dominate the World Cup, like, I don't know, the last five in a row, uh, now there's people paying attention to it. So you see, sometimes... You have to get past this quote unquote passion thing and understand what the purpose is. When NBC decided to put some effort into actually working at this, the sport blew up, right? Now, MLS, Apple just bought the rights to MLS. It's going to be part of Apple TV, right? Now, when Apple gets a hold of it, you think it's still going to be the way it is? No, because they're going in there with the intent of growing this and not sitting on the laurels of these other sports already exist. This sports market is saturated. No one in America is ever going to really watch soccer, you know, and now it's one of the hugest growing things out there. So you watch it happen all the time in the regular, uh, say, mercantile world, but we get sidetracked by, again, other people putting stuff into our head. So I guess my primary takeaway is – once you know what that purpose is, and there again, there's lots of exercises you can do to help you figure it out. It's mostly what would you do that you love doing so much that you could get paid for, but you would actually do it for free. That's the easiest nutshell around it. So there's somebody listening to this right now that makes really, really incredible chocolate chip cookies and they get excited every time somebody says, hey, can you make me a batch? But they haven't turned it into a business yet. Yeah, that's probably the one. You probably could purpose and intent build the next Mrs. Fields and just haven't thought about it because you're too busy just enjoying the back rubs you get from it instead of, you know, turning it into something that can fulfill itself and allow you to share more of your dope cookies with the world. Hopefully with a little bit of that stuff I talked about earlier in it. <laughs> Perhaps you could talk about Ikigai a little bit because this is something that I've, you know, been really interested in since I first, since the, the idea came across my, my path when it was oh, many years ago. But um, that sort of ties in, I think, quite nicely with this, with, you know, a couple of extra sort of elements in there. Perhaps you could talk a little bit to, to that because I know it's something you've talked about a lot with us. I think you know this because you know me. And generally when I'm talking about it, I am talking about Ikigai. Mm -hmm. But I try not to, this is one of those weird ones. I try not to use the the words itself, number one, because it's misquoted and misexplained so many times. Mm -hmm. And number two, I don't want people to feel like you need some special skill or, you know, some some special whatever to do it. This is just the way things are in Japan. This is how people live, right? Um, and it's it's actually an Okinawan thing that gets played off as a Japan thing because we love to oversimplify stuff. Mm -hmm. Like Okinawa and Japan are completely different. Like us Puerto Ricans and Mexicans, we're different. We both speak Spanish, but we don't even understand each other half the time, right? There's a market difference. But to the oversimplifying things for the American palate, it kind of ruins part of you know, Ikigai. And I hate the fact that it's becoming so popular right now because <laughs> it's a little bit weird. But it's this idea of take what you love and what the world needs and what you could be paid for and what you're good at. And in the middle where those um, Vin Diesel's crisscross, there's your passion, your mission, your vocation, your profession. And the sweet spot in the middle of all of those Vin Diesel diagrams is your Ikigai, your absolute purpose in life. So, if you were looking for a good way to get started, you can go online right now and just look for like a free Ikigai worksheet and just fill out those boxes. Like, 
what do you love? I love communicating with people and, and talking to story, and stories and listening to stories. Uh, what does the world need? The world needs better understanding of the individual humans around them and stop putting themselves in these siloed parties and be like, I can't like them because, you know, they are a donkey. Well, I can't like them because they're an elephant, right? Like the world leads less of this separation and more inclusion. So I love hearing stories and telling stories. And the world needs to understand each other better. What's a great way for them to understand each other? Stories. All right, cool. Uh, what are you good at? I am good at presenting. So I'm good at presenting stories. Uh, what else are you good at? I have a voice made for radio. So I can present stories with a voice that's kind of easy to pay attention to. Um, what else can you do? I'm good at teaching. Oh, okay. So I'm good at teaching. Good at telling stories, good at presenting stories, and what the world need. More people need to hear stories. So how do you get paid? I'm going to teach people how to tell stories. Bingo, bango, pickle, mango, <laughs> icky guy. Uh, I think I think it's worth you know touching on that because it, it it does have those extra couple of elements about you know finding this thing of you know as well as just the the passion and what you're good at and what you love doing. It's those extra elements that sort of tie it all together. That yeah, you can actually do this sort of long term. <clears throat> I mean, it's something that I found recently that the um, my <laughs> my side little project was this YouTube channel. Um, but it was through, you know, sessions with you and so on that I've come to realize that actually, this is the, the thing that I find the most joy in doing. And I can actually craft an entire business out of this as well. And so I've definitely had a, a shift of focus over the, uh, you know, the, the months of, uh, you know, sessions and and so on. So it's been a, a real, a real sort of journey for me to, 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 to realize that out of this and that, yeah, I can actually make something more of it. And it comes from exactly the sort of thing that you've just outlined. Well, because, okay. So you, you realize now through that, like having the passion, I see having the passion without the mission. Mm -hmm. So I, I think purpose is Passion is passion. I just love this, okay? Mm -hmm. The mission is what are you going to do with the fact that you love it, right? And from that, if you're able to generate a, a gospel, if you will, something that you can share and spread with the world, that becomes the vocation side of it, right? That's what vocation is really about. If you put those together, that becomes your profession. Your profession is going out and teaching something that you're highly passionate about because you have a mission to increase people's say technical capabilities right or their technical literacy if you will so those things once together that middle spot that sweet spot in the middle that becomes your ikigai so the passion without the mission is already horrible but then if you got the passion and the mission but you lack the self-discipline aka the vocation purpose without discipline is straight up meaningless right like, like, could you imagine um, Tom Brady, like, just a skillful quarterback, but I have no intention on playing football. I mean, the people in Massachusetts would have nothing to talk about. <laughs> you know, like he brought them six Super Bowls because he added that that vocation. He added that work ethic. He added that that level of of self-discipline that allowed him to get to the level where he could win six Super Bowls and basically change the world. You know, there are people out here who swear he didn't deflate those balls. He did. <laughs> but, sorry. That's my Raiders part leaking out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird space. It's, it's it, cause it's so simple, but it seems complicated. I think people overcomplicate it, but it's mm -hmm. literally, it is literally so simple got a passion for something and you have a mission on what to do with that passion and put the work in it that becomes a vocation you could turn that into a profession and then it feeds itself now you're icky guy mm -hmm. so <clears throat> perhaps you could talk then just uh, briefly as well about like we, I, i've alluded to it but what is your sort of your purpose that you've sort of distilled it down to and talk about you know well, how well, it's funny because I, I i went through the actual boxes <laughs> my 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 uh my icky guy is I believe that I'm I'm here to help people get their stories out. And through telling your stories and sharing your passions 
and your mission with the world, you're literally picking up somebody every time, no matter how crazy you think it is. At one point in time, this is funny because it's the thing now, so we can talk about it. You know, five, six years ago, someone who was a furry was going to be hiding in the closet with their secret sauce because they didn't, there wasn't a whole bunch of other ones out there. They thought once they started talking to each other, it becomes a convention in Las Vegas. And then because of the convention in Las Vegas, it becomes a topic on a couple of TV shows, you know, mostly poking fun of, you know, just be honest, they were attempting to exploit what they thought, you know, people's weird kink, but it also brought awareness to the other people that were hiding that there's other people out there like you that are furries. And now they're out in the open. They don't hide from each other anymore. They can let their freak flag fly, if you will. So they don't have to seem like they're different or weird or whatever. Come to find out whatever you're into, a whole bunch of people are into it like you. It's really strange, but it's a thing. I remember uh, maybe like 15, 20 years ago, I was going through this cobalt blue phase. I don't know why, but I was in love with cobalt blue. It became like it was everything. Blue bottles. It might have been Zima when it, when it came in a blue bottle. Uh, but for some reason, I was on that kick. And I remember like my friends used to make fun of me and I wouldn't really talk about it because I was a little bit psycho about the color cobalt blue. And I remember going somewhere and I was uh, talking to this person at the time I'm working in insurance and I was trying to sell them an Allstate policy. And I remember saying, oh, look, it's a really cool uh, bottle you have over there. And they're like, what bottle? And I was like, oh, the cobalt blue. And like, I, for some reason, I don't know what it is, but I have this thing about cobalt. And the guy was like, really? Okay, hold on. Takes me into another room, has a collection of cobalt bottles from when they first came out all the way to now like ancient, ancient bottles, bottles worth thousands of dollars because he'd been collecting cobalt blue bottles. The randomness of finding someone else who was into this cobalt, and I was just a color, but he connected it to his bottle, and then, yeah, I closed the sale, you know, and that sale is worth a bunch of policies, so I get to go back, you know, to the office and be like, hey, look what I did today. Well, how'd you pull that off? We've been talking to that guy for years. Cobalt blue. <laughs> what? None of your business. Pay up. <laughs> you see what I'm, you see what I'm saying? So you yep. never know. Mm -hmm. This is why you never know who's whose spark you're going to spark by telling your story. So you got to let them out, bro. Mm -hmm. Simple. Well, you're just uh, a master at drawing that out of uh, you know other people as well, as well as as well as sharing your own at drawing it out of other people. And it's it's been so nice as part of the uh, you know, LGL community and in the drop squad just to see people who have come in there just like you know I went in in May last year um, and then watching everyone else's progression and seeing people you know step out of the comfort zones and share their messages so yeah it's just uh, been been a pleasure to be a part of that and to, to see to see that in action <laughs> thank you I appreciate it it's 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 really weird because oftentimes when I'm doing it like it's not top of mind anymore it's just second nature and like dragging stuff out of people to get them to tell their stories or stand up or share or whatever. I don't feel like it requires the same level of effort as before. Now I think it's almost on automatic, mm -hmm. which is both positive and negative. Like you, you do want to do things intentionally. You don't want them to become so automatic that you don't have systems in place and things like that to keep it going. But it is more comfortable for me to drag someone out of their shell now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I kind of get a kick out of it, especially the ones that swear up and down that they're just ain't like this. <laughs> you know, the people that are afraid. I don't want to be on camera. I don't want to do this. I don't do Okay, Katie, now what? <laughs> she's on the podcast. You know, she's out here like three, four times a week. She got two of her own shows now. Mm -hmm. So it was funny. It's like, no. You're not, you're here. You can do all this stuff. I don't like doing that stuff. That was exactly the conversation when I got hired. Right. And now Katie is out there, like, you just you know, having a good old time and making friends and taking names, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I get a kick out of seeing that kind of change. <laughs> That's, uh, it's, it's so cool. And Katie's, yeah, Katie's doing awesome. It's great to, great to she's see so her awesome. stepping up and doing so many live streams now. <laughs> and, and, and I, the, like you just said, she's so awesome. Yeah. Imagine her keeping that to herself because yeah. someone said, to her a long time ago that oh, being afraid on camera is normal. Yeah, yeah. 
You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. the, the gift that Katie is would not be shared in the world if she listened to the nonsense somebody else put in her head. That's what I think. I'm, I'm here to un -F the nonsense that all of us <laughs> got told when we were kids. Uh -huh. Right? Like, you can't read her. Speak when spoken to her. Shut up unless someone's talking to you. That Even the I'm an introvert. No such word. Shut up. Don't say that. Mm -hmm. It's not a real word. Somebody made that mess up because it helps control some other people. Like every single person in this planet is an actual ambivert. All of us. Ain't nobody shy. Somebody told you that. Ain't nobody like I only, I don't like being around people because I get, no, somebody put that on you. Take, find out who did it. S dig deep in your brain, meditate on it, pray on it, do whatever. Find out who did it, forgive them and forget that they ever told you that. Because I guarantee you, if I put a, 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 a Pelican case and I open it up and it has a million dollars in it. First of all, you can't fit a million dollars in a single case movie <laughs> people. Would you stop that crap? A uh, million dollars weighs a lot. <laughs> okay. Anyway, if I can open up a thing and there's a check for a million dollars and a U.S. too, right? We'll give you, we'll start with a good currency. And I told you like, okay, you can get this, but you have to speak rhapsodically from the top of your brain for 24 hours straight and don't stop. I bet you every single person can do it. Oh, by the way, there's going to be cameras in a crowd of people. No you problem. <laughs> Show me the case. Not a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not a problem. You'd be like, and just come out. You start talking. Well, back in then, and then Miss Rosen, and I remember when she first gave us the algebra problems. <laughs> like you'd be, on, you'd be like an eight year old telling about dinosaurs. So stop it with the lies, because when you're given an opportunity to talk about that thing that you love, which I'm picking on Katie again, is them socks. Yo, she could tell you everything there is to know about these socks. That's so, so true. <laughs> so true. It almost seems like deflationary to start talking about tech, but I do always like to have a little section at the end where we talk about like your setup. And I think that what you've said there is just the perfect point to wrap up the, uh, you know, that side of things and just have a quick chat about, you know, your studio setup, because it's something that has, uh, has influenced me. I mean, I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a few steps behind you. So whenever you get some new lights, it's like, okay, I'll put those on my list. I've got the Pavo tubes behind me. <laughs> then you get some longer ones. It's like, right, write those on my list. <laughs> so <laughs> perhaps you could talk a little bit about the evolution of that as well. And, um, you know, I know you went through the green screen phase as I, as I did <laughs> at some point. So perhaps you could just talk a little bit about that, the evolution and where you are and, and also where you see it sort of developing. So I didn't really think about this again until you sort of bring it up. I think I started the green screen evolution because back when I started it, it was hard to do and it's still hard to do, but it was hard to do and not everybody could. Right. So the fact that I knew how, because I did come from broadcast space, I was like, I could do this because it's going to be the level up because most people can't do it. Right. I had the one K lights I had the 4K cameras. I had everything you need to do green screen correctly. And I realized that when I would go into to post-production and I edit my whole show together and then I got to sit there and key it for like an hour, it was stupid. <laughs> I was like, this is wasting time. I could have <laughs> had the episode upload. Back then, uploading the video to YouTube took some time too. So to go through all of those changes and you upload the video and then you're like, oh, my God, I miss keying one of the clips because even adjustment layers wasn't a thing yet. Right. I'm like, I'm, I got to take down the video, re-render the new video, which, again, took hours and then upload it again, which took hours. And I was like, yo, this is just dumb. Just get over this idea of the green screen thing and just let your studio be funny looking. All right, bet. So it just became like a black rag on a wire rack. And. I just kept adding to it a little bit from there. Changed the microphone, right? Upgraded the mic, then upgraded to a different mic, then added some different lights and then added some color splash and, you know, work your way around until you got the fancy neon sign in the big screen TV and old Bertha over here with all my cameras in it. And I think that's the way to do it. I think going and taking out a second mortgage and dumping a bunch of stuff all at once, not a good look because you're not going to learn how to use the tools properly. Mm -hmm. So you, this is one of those things you can't just throw money at. You just can't. So even if someone said, okay, here, I'll give you 50 grand to bless your studio. Most people don't even have that list ready of what next. So they're just going to go buy a bunch of stuff 
and don't know how they work, don't know how they interact, right? Um, of course, that's what they got you for. But yeah, it, it's important that you just don't go get a stream deck until you realize what you're going to do with it. Like, why? You know, because just having one leads to frustration. And then the comment that we hear, you and I hear more than anybody else because people feel the need to confess to us. Oh, man, I got the stream deck and I use it for Ecamm, but I don't really use it for anything else. Mm -hmm. And in the back of my head, well, then you just insert your favorite bad word here, wasted 250 bones. It's way more powerful than just using it for Ecamm. It, you know what I mean? You legit wasted 250. You could have spent that on Facebook ads to get more people to your show. <laughs> so I don't know. Like, like it, it's it's important that you take your time and do it right. Also, don't just buy some crap because it's cheap. Because I swear you're gonna buy it three times. Mm -hmm. that, I, I get messages every day from people that says, "I know you told me that when I first started, and I remember saying, <laughs> but then now I got the SM7B. I should have bought this a long time ago." Yeah, that, that could go for so many areas of life, though, as well, couldn't it? You know, <laughs> it's trying to save a little bit here, and then you end up paying like 10 times more in the long run because of it. <laughs> I still get caught out by that myself occasionally. I'd look at something and think, Me too. Mm, do I really? Oh, I'll, I'll just make do with this one. And then like a week later, I'm cursing myself. Like, why did I, why did I fall into that trap again? <laughs> do we, we all do it. Even knowing better, we all do it now to this very, very moment in time. And it's like, oh, I'm going to get this one because it's on sale. And then it's broken. And then you're right back at the same store looking at another one. So, uh -huh. yeah, I just, it's it's not worth it. Sometimes, you know, you really just got to put your head down and and kind of pick the good stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And so in, yeah. in terms of your, your gear then, we don't need to go through everything, but what are you using like for your your main lights and what other lights? I mean, I mentioned the, the, the Pavo tubes that I've got here, but what have you got behind you and what are the, the sort of main lights that you're using at the moment? So the ones behind me, they're all NAND lights. They're all Pavo tubes. The only one exception is the light bulb right there. That is the last um, aperture AMRAM piece I have in the building. I've switched everything to NAND light because of control, honestly. Um, my key light is a Nanlite 200, and my fill is a Forza 60, a Nanlite Forza 60, so Forza 200, Forza 60, uh, two Pavo tubes in the back there. They are Pavo tube 15Xs, though, so they're the newer pixel-based ones mm -hmm. that can do all kind of fancy dancy stuff. <laughs> in this drawer right here, I have six... Pavo tube six C's, the little guys. Yeah, that's that's what I use behind me. <laughs> yeah, and then I have a whole bunch of the Nanlite uh, five C's, the little squares. I think I got like eight of them. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I love them because the build quality. Um, they're very versatile. They can be anything I want. Like come Halloween, I could turn this whole room red and black, and you know have you know Vincent Price thing on the TV back there doing the laugh the whole nine yards just for a couple of buttons. And it's funny because I swear I saw you a little bit ago and your background was purple and now it's blue. See, that's the, to me one of the best things about it, right? Is that you can make it be whatever you want it to be temporarily without mm -hmm. having to get out a paintbrush. So yeah. that's where it shines the most to me. That's another thing that I got from you as well was the, uh, the, the precise color code <laughs> for the paint of the back wall, that gray to uh, God, that took so that. long to figure out. <laughs> well, I'm glad you did it because I just went and got the code and I was like, right, give me this paint. And <laughs> well, you know, because it could have been a shortcut, right? I could have shortcutted it and just went gray and know that it'll kind of work. Mm -hmm. But because I, and this is one of those weird things, because I understand cameras and white balance, I knew that having a color cast paint was going to jack up the white balance of my camera, especially because modern cameras white balance off of gray. Right. So I'm like, I can't do this. I got to get the right paint. And I spent three months working it out. But I think that not having that experience, I would have just got some regular color paint. It would have not been right. And then you're out here bad mouthing the paint. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that people often do. Right. Well, I can't believe, you know, the iPhone can't do so and so and so. And I'm like, look, watch here. Click, 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 click. Oh, I didn't know that was there because you didn't look you were going to get more clicks out of saying it didn't do this. So you went there, <laughs> you know, you're like the, the bird in the thing with the mouth open, screaming to the mom to drop the worms and stuff in your mouth. You just make a noise. But if you actually spent the time 
and then you went and shared with everybody how to actually do it, not only would you have solved the problem yourself, you would have made the day for like another 50, 60, mm -hmm. 70, couple hundred thousands, could be hundreds of thousands of people. So which is better? Going on there, bitching and complaining, get 50,000 people to agree with you and make 50,000 other angry people feeling <laughs> inadequate or learn how to do it the right, insert your favorite bad word here, mm -hmm. teach people how to do it the right way, save somebody else the stress, time, money, mm -hmm. and then put that level of positivity into the world. Mm -hmm. It's choice. It's all choices. You got options. Definitely the better approach, the latter. <laughs> and what is it then in your, your studio, would you say, that is your favorite bit of uh, sort of tech at the moment that you've uh, you've got that you're working with? Ooh. Uh, this, this bad boy right here. I'm not even using it for my streaming, but for my other content creation. This is the Insta360 X3. Um, Insta360 camera any model. They're just dope AF. But I really, really enjoy this because it allows me to be more versatile in my content capturing and you can just capture so much more stuff mm -hmm. and put that out there and it's fun on vacation it's good for you and the kids like you and the kids can just run around the backyard and play with it and you just make cool family memories it might never see the social internet but man your kids would just be like oh dad this is dope mm -hmm. it's waterproof it's it basically I hate to say this word, indestructible. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, uh, Ali, I broke my camera. I thought you said it was indestructible, <laughs> dog. <laughs> so, and I don't know. And, and Rob, Rob Valls, our, our mutual friend, got me stuck on it, and I'm in love with it. It's literally the best thing. And I got Dina stuck on it now, so I'm sharing the love. <laughs> Getting <laughs> people stuck on his 360 cameras. <laughs> oh, definitely have to, definitely have to check that out. Uh, before we wrap it up, um, what are you reading at the moment? I always like to ask for a book recommendation as well. What's what's uh... the mountain is you? I, uh, the mountain is you. Her name is uh, Brittany Vice. No, that's not right. Oh, what? See, now you made me. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll find it and drop it in the uh, the show notes. Yeah, because because um we talked about this on Saturday, mm -hmm. right? Hold on, you know I can't help it. <laughs> it's an open loop there. <laughs> uh, oh, Brianna. It's Brianna Vice. That's what mm -hmm. it is. Um, the Mountain is You is a very, very good book. And it's about transforming uh, self-sabotage into self-mastery because I believe even at my station in life still, I, I do self-sabotage self things. Mm -hmm. um, and... Everybody does it to some extent. Me too. I was like, man, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm way too good at the, what I'm doing to be where I'm at. And it's not even from a level of like, you know, greed or whatever. Cause like I could be perfectly stoked with the money I'm making right now and the life that I have, but <laughs> this is going to sound super cheesy, but I swear you, this is from the bottom of my heart. I get super pissed off when I had a friend he, he we're talking he's like oh business is good like oh yeah yeah how you doing right now he's like oh, i i make you know like a uh, hundred thousand a year take home whatever like that and i go bro you have a hot product and with a couple minor changes it can become an epic product and you could probably 10x your revenue and he said to me oh no i don't really need to do that i kind of just like you know what I'm doing right now. Without. And I said, you're a dick. And he's like, what do you mean? And I was like, not me. I'm atheist, but you said you're Christian. Yeah, I am. I go to church, you know, blah, blah, blah. I go, yeah, one of the things that I remember when I was in the thing was, you know, the charity and like giving, giving to the people who are in need. And we said, we together have stood at church and passed out food, you know, on holidays and things like that. And he was like, what's that have to do with anything? I'm like to have the ability to make a couple minor changes in your life that could 10 extra salary means that instead of making a hundred grand a year, you can make a million a year and you can give away 900,000 without that much extra work. You're a dick. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, he was just like floored. Like he had a hard time processing that. Called me back like a week later and was like, yeah, you're right. Like, what do I need to do? You know what I mean? So 
I think when you when you get to a certain level of skill, we can self sabotage ourselves mm -hmm. and even be against your own mission that you said, mm -hmm. right? I want to do this because it'll be really good for the community and blah blah blah, and then get like, oh, I'm doing eighty hours of work a week, I'm done. No, you said you was doing it for the community, which means eighty two hours ain't going to kill you. Mm -hmm. you. You know what I'm saying? Like if you really are about being altruistic, then be altruistic. Like put the all. In all touristic, I know it's spelled differently, but that way. <laughs> really, that was <laughs> and, and then uh, yeah, so this is a really good book, and then and it talks about some things that are, are helping me to get a handle on self sabotagery. I'll I'll definitely be reading that one myself because I'm certainly guilty of of, of doing that to myself <laughs> at uh, various different levels uh, on an ongoing basis, <laughs> as as well. Yeah, you know. I think we all do. Yeah. I think we all do out of a protection game, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I know everybody in here has at least had one relationship that they ruined on purpose that they shouldn't have. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, that is that is a great uh, little nugget to leave people on to uh, go and check out that book. And uh, we are at the top of the hour, and I want to be conscious of uh, of your time. But where is the best place for people to go and find you and where would you like to direct people? Obviously, I've left links to all the places in the in the show notes, in the description and so on. But where Probably would you... Discord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the social stuff is there, but then you're just feeding on content and I don't want you to just feed. I can cook my face off, but I don't want you to feed. I want you to share your food too. So Discord to me would be the dopest because it allowed people to dive in right away and be bi-directional in the conversation mm -hmm. instead of just get indoctrinated. I don't want to indoctrinate anybody, you know? Well, I have a couple things I'd like to fix, but <laughs> <laughs> for the most part, for the most part, I want to hear your side as well. So I think Discord is probably the best place. Cool. Well, it's such a, a wonderful community and uh, the Let's Get Live community in over there. So that will for sure be linked in the uh, the show notes of the description as well. And yeah, it's just such a, such a wonderful place. And the the Drop Squad, obviously, the uh, you know the weekly get-togethers we have is uh, is is epic as well. Glorious. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's fun. I swear, I learn as, I learn a lot from you guys as much as I teach to you guys. Um, and I think that again, that's one like I didn't want to be one of those like indoctrinating instructors i can't stand them they really irritate me mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so i i really enjoy the fact that even sometimes from the craziest sources we learn things right so yeah gotta be open-minded totally totally thank you so much for being here today doc it's been a real pleasure speaking to you i hope you've enjoyed the therapy session <laughs> yeah yeah um i don't know if you take blue cross <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, like I say, I can't thank you enough for all the uh, the help and support you've given me, certainly on uh, on my uh, my journey since we've uh, we've come to know each other, and uh, for your friendship as well. So, uh, always appreciate you for all that you've uh, you've done for me and for for everyone. Thank you. I'm I'm loving the new podcast with the apostrophe s. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty pretty. Uh, that's not an apostrophe. These are parentheses. But see, uh, I can't even speak English now. <laughs> There's caffeine that needs to happen. <laughs> <laughs> cool stuff. I know you've had a, a busy day of uh, a busy schedule of being on other shows as well. So uh, I'll let you get some caffeine. <laughs> cool. Thanks again, Doc. Much appreciated. Mahalo. Well, you have been listening to the live streamer backstage podcast and if you have just been listening rather than watching then you definitely want to go and check out the video of this podcast as well which you can find on my uh, take one tech youtube channel uh, and then you'll be able to see some of those uh, behind the scenes shots or see the uh, the background that doc was working with when we're starting to talk about the uh, the tech as well but definitely uh, for sure go and check out the uh, discord community as well of docs and i'll leave a link to that in the show notes if you'd like to connect with me then you can also check out the show notes uh, and visit my uh, website takeonetech.io to find all of the things there as well. I'll see you next time with another great show and another great guest and conversation. So thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.